part of the problem when the experts light their own credibility on fire and nobody trusts anything the government says anymore because of all their misfeasance, malfeasance and lies. I mean, yeah. That, I mean, that's I think the they problem. would lie. I think they would absolutely lie to cover their tracks. I do. And I think they'd lie to cover the tracks of uh, what corporations. What would the incentive be, talk? though? They knew it was unsafe of knowingly telling people, yes, go back. They don't, it's not like government people want their citizens to die. Hey, guys. Welcome back to The Base Brief. This week, a tragic shooting at Michigan State an environmental disaster in Ohio, and yet another conservative media sexual harassment scandal. Let's jump in. All right, Brad, happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. How do you feel about Valentine's Day? I'm curious. I love Valentine's Day. Even when I'm single, I have a nice Galentine's routine I do. I think it's fantastic. Galentine's. Yeah, I don't, even when I'm in a relationship, I often have Galentine's and Valentine's because they're kind of separate, but they're both equally fun. I believe in treating yourself at all times so i don't understand the valentine's day haters the people who are like eh, the corporate holiday is just made up all holidays are made up all holidays are made up and they're all fun why are you a hater and in general why are this whole thing where people are just haters in general if something brings somebody else joy why do you get off knocking it down i don't get that and i think if you hate valentine's day you're just bitter and mean because there's nothing to hate. There you get wine, you get chocolates, you usually get a nice dinner. Sometimes you get jewelry or other presents. Like, just have a great time. Be a happy person. That's where I'm at. I'm, ta- I'm making my boyfriend take me out for ice cream sundaes. So. See? That sounds delightful. I just, I think people should get behind it. Um, One update for folks before we jump into the headlines this week. Brad and I will be in Seattle next week. Next Wednesday, we'll be at the University of Washington doing a debate with the walk away campaign i'm pretty excited for it i've only been to seattle for one day before and i actually loved it it was beautiful the weather it was in june but the weather was amazing i'm hoping to see orcas in the wild it's my dream you're you're trying to get me to go on a boat with you um i don't know if that's gonna happen we'll we'll see well (laughs) i I did some research last night and apparently we're out of season like the if you go may through september they say like you're guaranteed to see some orcas but right now it's a little iffy so i don't know if i'm gonna ask you to like sacrifice going out on a boat for maybe seeing orcas we'll just have to see how it works yeah if anybody's seattle based go check out our social media we posted information about this event we would love to have you come out I'm looking forward to it. I don't do a lot of travel, but this was a really exciting event. So I decided to get on board for it. And it will be fun to have some back and forth with students. I'm really, I'm excited to do some Q&A more than anything. Um, but yeah. All right. Well, we have to turn our attention back to your home state today. Unfortunately, there was a tragic event last night. We had yet another mass shooting, this time at Michigan State University. Let's roll this clip. We begin with the mass shooting at Michigan State University. At least three people are dead and five more wounded after a gunman opened fire at two locations on campus. ABC's Alex Perez is in East Lansing, Michigan with the latest. Run! Horror at Michigan State University after a gunman opened fire at multiple locations on campus, killing at least three and wounding five. All of the victims, students at the school. He's not a student, faculty, staff. And we have no idea why he came to campus to do this. The suspect, a 43-year-old Anthony Dwayne McRae, also dead after an hours-long manhunt. Authorities saying he died from an apparently self-inflicted gunshot. We're requesting all units to respond to station. Have an active shooter at 509 East Circle Drive at Berkey Hall in MSU's campus. The chaos unfolding Monday night around 8.18 p.m. when police say they received multiple 911 calls about a shooting at Berkey Hall. Yeah, so this is obviously really heartbreaking stuff, and it does hit a little close to home. That's less than an hour away from me. In fact, I was at uh, my soccer game last night, and people's phones were dinging with active shooter alerts when this was going down who have people who have some connection to MSU. Uh, And it was pretty wild. Um, So I will say, you know, my heart goes out to everybody involved. And immediately I was like, oh, this is really upsetting. And then I braced myself for the inevitable grotesque reaction, typically, and in this case, from multiple prominent Democrats in our state, politicizing this and immediately using it as a club to beat their political opponents. And that's exactly what we saw. So 
the uh, Democratic Majority Whip, so one of the top members of the state government in the Democratic Party, Ranjiv Puri, uh, actually put out a statement. And the first sentence, Hannah, you really can't make this up. The first step, the first sentence is, F your thoughts and prayers. <laughs> That's the first sentence of the official statement from the uh, House Majority Whip. And then they go on to say, we do not need to live like this. The U.S. is the only country where this happens. Living in a society plagued with violence can be protected, can be prevented. This is a symptom of years of inaction. Uh, and so then they immediately go to push gun control. Uh, there was also the Democratic Congresswoman Elisa Slotkin, who came out and said this. Take a listen. Michigan, I cannot believe that I am here again doing this 15 months later. And I am filled with rage that we have to have another press conference to talk about our children being killed in their schools. And I would say that you either care about protecting kids or you don't. You either care about having an open, honest conversation about what is going on in our society or you don't. But please don't tell me you care about the safety of children if you're not willing to have a conversation about keeping them safe in a place that should be a sanctuary. Wow, that was particularly infuriating to watch. I I feel like we're at this impasse when it comes to the gun control debate or really when it comes to the violence epidemic debate because both sides are pretty entrenched. Both sides are completely talking past each other. And and both sides are doing this thing that I actually think is just the death knell in politics where they are deciding their opponents are driven by immoral motivations, that they don't care about kids, that they don't care about violence. And I think whenever you get to that point in a conversation, it's done. You're not going to get much further because you aren't even taking time to understand your opponent's um, desires or, or reasons that they want the policies that they want. I think it is flatly false to say that any single person in this country does not care when these things happen, is unmoved by violence, is it's apathetic towards people being gunned down at their bodies of education. That's, that's not the case across the board. And I am absolutely wholeheartedly 1,010% in the pro-gun camp. And I fundamentally believe that the gun control camp is responsible for more of these mass shootings than they will ever um, admit to. I also think, though, that the individual is responsible. And I understand and have empathy why you have knee-jerk reactions to these kinds of events and that you oftentimes people, they reach for what seems to be the easiest policy solution, right? They don't often have a lot of experience in setting policy. They don't understand a lot of the cause and effect that you see in public policy. And so they say, oh, you just get rid of the gun, this goes away. And and they, you know, obviously haven't thought much deeper past it, but I do get that, that knee-jerk reaction. They never take the time to actually understand the bulk of information and data that our camp is operating off of and our argument in this case which would be these things would not happen if they were not gun-free zones you have increasingly made our bodies our academic bodies from grade school all the way up through college gun-free zones you make students sitting ducks in in the vast majority of these institutions and this was something that bothered me even when i was in college i was always concerned about this kind of thing happening i went to a private Christian college that still did not allow you to even keep a gun within your residency. I had um, friends who had their apartments broken into in the middle of the night while we were in college. One of my former roommates woke up to a man next to her bed one night. There were scary things that happened. One of my other roommates got my mugged. Gosh. We were in downtown Nashville. Like We're in a major city. These kinds of things happen and you don't allow students, particularly women, to defend themselves. Instead, you have these stupid little boxes across a lot of campuses where you're supposed to just hit the button and hope somebody gets there in time to save you if you are attacked while walking around. It is absurd. And you you know, when they say these things don't happen in other countries, you do see uh, acts of mass violence in other countries. Murder doesn't happen in other countries, Hannah. Nobody <laughs> gets killed. Nobody the US gets is killed. It's uniquely bad. Yeah. They never want to actually um, really dig into the facts of the data, which is that we are a much bigger country than most others out there. And when you were trying to compare us to France or to England, you're you're not really making an apples to apples comparison first and foremost. But even if you were to get into like what would be a more fair comparison of data, say take Michigan compared to London or to Paris or to other gun free zones, you would not see these vastly higher rates of violence in the US compared to those countries. You would just see different 
weapons being used to carry out those attacks. And that's the kind of honest conversation that we actually want to have that this representative claimed in her speech we aren't willing to sit down and, and talk through. Yeah, and I just hate this idea that, you know, like this issue isn't complicated. There's just the good guys and the bad guys and the people who don't care about dead kids and the people who do care about dead kids. Come on, that is so divisive and toxic and it's so oversimplistic. Um, I, I just hate this kind of rhetoric, especially because in this situation, this was made before we even know anything about the motive of the shooter, before we have confirmed what kind of gun they used, how they obtained the gun, any really of the details have yet to come in. Yet these representatives are speaking about it as if their policy agenda would have for sure meant that things like this couldn't happen. They actually have no idea. Because it turns out that the shooter or the suspected shooter actually in the past pled guilty to illegally possessing a firearm. So clearly <laughs> gun rules probably well, weren't going to stop this delayed. individual. Uh, and what's more, as you mentioned, and we're about to dive into, in the state of Michigan, college campuses are uh, legally required to be gun-free zones. You are even if, and this has never made sense to me, my campus, UMass Amherst, was like this. In fact, women weren't even allowed to carry pepper spray or mace or a taser. Uh, so wow. that wasn't even allowed, which I always found so outrageous. Uh, women and men weren't allowed. It was not, it was prohibited under the campus weapons policy. Um, and, and I guess it's like they really just don't mind leaving people vulnerable, which shocks yep. me. But it's always been crazy to me, the idea that so many college campuses prohibit you from exercising, especially public ones. If a private college wants to be a gun-free zone, I think that is their right, even though I don't really agree with it. Um, but a public college should be forced to respect the Second Amendment. It's nuts that like at, at 19 or 20 in many states, you can carry a gun around. It, like, for example, in Massachusetts, a 21-year-old um, could live in Boston, work, carry a gun with them with a permit uh, to the grocery store. But if they're a college junior, they can't have a gun with them on campus. It does. It's never made any sense. Uh, and it's always been uh, just just mind boggling to me. But then when stuff like this happens, I just wish there had been somebody there who could have stopped it, who could have protected people. Because like you said, I mean, you can push a button, you can call the police. But by the time they get there, it's often going to be too late. Well, so when you and I were first discussing the story, I was under the impression that all public universities actually banned guns because it is pretty common that they do. But actually, once we dug into the data, we realized there's been a pretty big movement over the past couple of years, past decade or so. Um, really after the Virginia Tech shooting took place in 2007, there was a group called Students for Concealed Carry. And they started taking a really active role in urging the repeal of campus self-defense bans across the states. This actually was a state issue, not a federal one. And they've been pretty successful at lobbying for changed laws in more than a dozen states, but there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, as of right now, 16 states prohibit concealed carry on campus. That means the universities and colleges have no choice. Uh, those are California, Florida, which I found interesting, Illinois, Louisiana, Massachusetts, Michigan, Missouri, Nebraska, Nevada, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, North Carolina, North Dakota, South Carolina, and Wyoming. Michigan, so some red states on that in there. List, of course. Yeah, Michigan there, but also several red states that you would sort of anticipate would be better on these kinds of things. So I thought that was interesting data. And this data that I'm pulling actually is for this organization, Students for Concerned Carry. They have this on their website. Um, so you can check out their efforts if you're interested in what they're doing. I think it's pretty interesting. Uh, they say that 23 states permit colleges to make their own rules against campus carry. And so there's kind of a hodgepodge um, of, of laws going down in those 23 states. And then 11 states expressly permit concealed carry on campus. Those are Arkansas, Colorado, Georgia, Idaho, Kansas, Mississippi, Oregon, Tennessee, Texas, Utah, and Wisconsin. But what I thought was interesting under that is that while those states expressly permit concealed carry on campus, it's still really like a very patchwork kind of thing. Like Tennessee's campus carry is confined to faculty and staff only. And they say some colleges have actually taken action to reduce concealed carry on campuses, even in states which allow it. Uh, in Oregon, there was a court ruling revoking statutory bans on campus carry. The Education Board voted to exclude campus carry from buildings by policy. So it's it's still sort of, you know, all over the place as far as but I remember. So I told you about this because you like you mentioned, were under the impression it wasn't allowed. But I remember this fight going down because campus carry was something I wrote about in college. I was a supporter of it. Um, and I remember all these predictions about Texas is going to turn into the wild, wild west because they only added it a few years ago. 
and there's going to be shootouts over classroom debates and all this stuff that simply did not come true. When you look at that list of states, Utah is not exactly a murder zone, right? Uh, Texas, uh, Wisconsin, Oregon. It's actually interesting to me that there are some blue states on this list and like you said, some red states on the other list that don't allow it. Um, but it, to me, it seems like common sense that the same rights to self-defense and constitutionally to keep and bear arms that everyone has in regular life as adults should also apply to a college campus. This never made any sense. And people will say, well, there's so much alcohol on college campuses. Well, you know what the funniest thing about that is, and so much drinking and irresponsible behavior. The funny thing about that is that your typical frat house is not on the campus. So you can have a gun there in your state, but you can't have it in your dorm. So if you were like me and I was a nerd who didn't drink and I lived in the honor <laughs> college on campus at UMass, I couldn't bear an arm if I wanted to around campus, but the frat bros could add whatever guns they wanted hanging on the walls of the frat house in the middle of their party, their keg party if they wanted to. Make it make sense. You simply can't. And I look, we can't say for sure that if that uh, MSU campus wasn't a gun-free zone or that if people had been allowed to carry that it would have been stopped. Uh, and I also, I think we wouldn't even say that people who oppose those things are, you know, to blame or responsible. It's the shooter who's responsible. We can say there's a chance and that when it comes to matters of life and death, people have the right to defend themselves. And I, I just so fundamentally believe that in terms of the Second Amendment and the right to bear arms, to me, it's an extension of the most fundamental right of all, the right to life. And so I've, I know that there's the argument about the Second Amendment, about resisting government tyranny, and th there's a validity to that, but I've always found the much more core element is just the basic right to defend your own life. And it's always tragic when these mass killings occur, but it's especially, especially heartbreaking to me when they occur in an area where people's fundamental right to defend themselves has been restricted, leaving them sitting ducks to this kind of sick and evil tragedy. I think those, those there's several very important points that you just made I want to emphasize. We cannot always say that if this were not a gun-free zone, this wouldn't have happened. But I will say if you study mass shootings across you know various states, they don't occur at gun ranges. They don't occur um, you know in places where it's sort of known that there's a pretty good chance people have guns and will fight back. I do think these people try to find the most vulnerable targets they can. I think they go in not wanting to have to fight back against anybody else. And so I do think there is a higher likelihood that you will be targeted when you are in a gun-free zone. And I also will say to your point that I don't think people who are on the other side of this argument are evil. I don't. I think you are uneducated. I think you're making a knee-jerk policy solution to a very complicated problem. And I would really just like the opportunity to sit down with anybody who is anti-gun and actually discuss the real data and the reasons why we are not, because they, it really does come from a place of being pro-life, of being um, able to defend yourself and of actually thinking this gives people a better fighting chance. So with that all being said, we have to talk about another kind of tragedy. This one is a wild ride. I'm guessing some of our listeners have probably not even heard about this because, to be honest, if it weren't for Twitter and the fact that my algorithm is very plugged into like libertarian and even Ohio circles because I used to lobby in Ohio, I don't know that I would have come across this. But there was a massive environmental catastrophe there over the past couple of days. Yeah, this was crazy to read about. Um, I will say that I didn't realize that train derailments were actually a common experience, uh, but they are. But what's not a common experience is the, that they lead to a hazard chemical uh, disaster, which is what happened recently in Ohio. So uh, this is some reporting from the Washington Post on this incident. It was 9 p.m. on February 3rd when 50 cars of a 141-car Norfolk Southern train derailed igniting a large blaze near the hazardous chemicals that kept firefighters away for days. The derailment, which caused no injuries, probably was caused by mechanical issues on one of the rail car axles, the National Transportation Safety Board has said. The incident caused further alarm nearly 48 hours after the crash, when changing conditions in a rail car calls, caused authorities to warn of a possible major explosion. And I don't know if folks have seen the videos, but there's this giant black plume. It looks like a missile went off or a bomb went off. Then, on Monday, they conducted a controlled release, officials did, 
of vinyl chloride to prevent a blast. And vinyl chloride, as you'll learn, is a uh, cancer-causing dangerous chemical that was uh, that was uh, you know being stored in these rail cars. Then on Wednesday, uh, they allowed residents. So this would be Wednesday of uh, over a week ago, actually. Um, they allowed residents to return, but did they? Did the authorities tell people to return to their homes much too early? Is the concern uh, because now we're learning that residents are smelling strange things, seeing dead animals, seeing dead fish. Uh, there's strange tastes, water, pets. Uh, pets are getting sick. Now, people are saying they feel symptoms. Take a listen to this media package from the Associated Press and then also from News Nation that includes an expert commenting, a resident describing her experience, and also one environmental activist's thoughts on this whole saga. We were in my room, which I had the door closed and it didn't smell in there. But my son came out and he was like, oh my God, it stinks, mom. It's, it smells like paint thinner. And I'm like, no, it doesn't. I got up and come out and, and it smelled like really really strong paint thinner and then his eyes turned like bloodshot and he started coughing and I was like yeah we're leaving so we hurry up and grabbed as much as we could and we took off. There's a lot of what ifs and we're going to be looking at this thing 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the line and wondering Gee, cancer clusters could pop up, you know, well water could go bad. And this video here, News Nation acquired of dead fish and cloudy water. Residents say they've also seen sick animals and their homes in town are still covered in debris. After 30 years of what I've been through and what this community is going through, they know. Come on, it's vinyl chloride. It's in the air. The fish are dying. Really? Does that give you comfort that maybe I should be in this area? Probably not. So that was crazy, but that's kind of what I've been seeing online as well, that the, uh, the stream of information around this has been all over the place. Residents have not been given very good communication or just the basic tools they need to make decisions about their own safety, it seems. And this is a terrifying event, right? This is something where I am pro-government almost never. I see very little role for government to play in almost anything. But when it comes to a, nat a natural disaster, I think the most important thing government can do is to give out real-time updates, factual information, give people news as things change, make sure they're, they're kept updated so that they can make the best decisions for themselves and their loved ones in real time, right? Central planning does not work even in a natural disaster. The government does not need to come in and, and do evacuations and tell people, you know, you go here, you go there. I think that just creates a lot of other additional problems. You just need to get people information and make sure this is accurate as possible. And this feels like not only are they not doing that, it almost feels like they're suppressing information and trying to ensure that they aren't given everything that they need to know or everything that's going on behind the scenes. Yeah, I mean, so we look at this issue of, Obviously, the government didn't cause this, uh, but they aren't being very transparent. Uh, so the the state EPA and the national EPA. Um, so we've got some more reporting here from the Washington Post. The Environmental Protection Agency has said the main chemicals involved were vinyl chloride, its byproducts, physogen and hydrogen chloride, butyl acrylate and others. Sorry about the pronunciation, y'all. But neither the EPA nor the NTSB has published a complete list of what the train was carrying. And people are pissed about that. They're like, um, I have a right to know what chemicals were potentially exposed to my home and my children. And they have not said all of the chemicals. Now, more from WAPO here. Some experts said that the EPA's air monitoring should have been done with more sophisticated devices and that it was unclear whether the agency had enough data when it told residents the air was safe. That is wild. They should err on the side of caution, yet they seem to have told people. I keep seeing everyone, the authorities saying, no testable levels are being found. Well, that doesn't mean no levels, first of all. And I'm sorry, but I, I would trust my own gut if I'm seeing fish floating up dead in the water rather than some government official telling me everything's fine. And actually, you know, the YouTube comments on the mainstream media coverage of this indicated that that's kind of how a lot of people are feeling. Right, Hannah? Right. And rightfully so, because they have a long history of lying to us about when we are exposed to dangerous chemicals. Look no further than, uh, was it Flint, Michigan, where we had the fluoride in the water? Uh, I saw Aaron Brockovich weighing in on this disaster, who was part of exposing a massive cover-up about poisonous chemicals in people's water in another town. The town my dad grew up in, in Anniston, Alabama, is one that Monsanto famously poisoned the water in and covered up for decades with the government's help. And 
it led to all kinds of health effects for people in that area. Cancer, random limbs being born on babies, all kinds of weird stuff that was going on. So I think people are absolutely correct to question the government's narrative here. Um, Joe Swanson is one person we saw on YouTube who said every local politician should be required to drink out of a public water hose live in town square before declaring it safe for residents. Based. Mm -hmm. Based. Absolutely. Rich says, if they say it's safe, have them drink a a glass of water from the stream. If they deny, then don't come back. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Yes. Spot on. Nate said, I would pack a few things and go far, shaking my head. I hope the best outcome for those families. Yeah, so do we. Um, But it would be so heartbreaking to not really know what's going on uh, when that's your home and those are your kids at stake. So one more comment said, when the when the political establishment says, I believe there will be no chemical contamin- contam- that contaminants in the water, you better be concerned. <laughs> I mean, look, I, I don't think they would knowingly lie about that kind of thing, but I also can't rule it out. Um, and I, I think it's part of the problem when the experts light their own credibility on fire and nobody trusts anything the government says anymore because of all their misfeasance and malfeasance and lies. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think they would lie. I think they would absolutely lie to cover their tracks. I do. And I think they'd lie to cover the tracks of uh, What would the incentive be, though, if they knew it was unsafe of knowingly telling people, yes, go back? It's not like government people want their citizens to die. No, I don't think it's that. I think it could be complete incompetence. It could be working to protect the special interests who are going to lose a lot of money. It could be trying to stop an actual panic and and mass rush to get out of there. They have all kinds of incentives that they use for population control. But I think you don't have to look any further than COVID to say, why would they lie? I mean, they lied to us consistently about some of the best ways to approach COVID, what we should be doing, what we shouldn't be doing. And, you know, you can get into the why of all of it all. But the fact is, we know that they do lie. They do cover up and they often do provide bad information to people. I think it's more likely they're giving bad information than giving knowingly false information. But I guess either way, we're not really going to (laughs) know. The story gets wilder, though. A A reporter for News Nation was actually arrested while reporting on a briefing from Ohio Governor Mike DeWine. There's a a really disturbing video showing this dude thrown to the ground and cuffed, and everyone's like, what's going on here? Just because he was uh, broadcasting live and reporting, and I guess they were telling him to move or something, and he wouldn't, Um, and then he was arrested. I just think these people... (sighs) Who does PR for these people for, in these government agencies? Like, it seems like they sometimes do the the worst possible thing they could possibly do in terms of perception and public trust. They're like, oh, what could we do that would most feed the conspiracies and distrust of us possibly at this moment? Hmm, yeah, let's arrest a reporter at our press conference while people are demanding answers. It's just like, seriously? It is the audacity for me in that situation. And on top of that, I will say if we're at the point in the story where we are arresting journalists, then I think we can say without any doubt that we are not getting the absolute truth in this matter. Yeah, I don't know why you need to be arresting the media if you're being upfront with the public. It's pretty nuts. Um, I do want to include the context for folks that so so you don't start. I've seen a lot of like, why are so many trains suddenly derailing? Because it's not just Ohio. There's been uh, over a dozen since the new year. It actually is way more common than I thought. So here's some reporting from Newsweek. Uh, the explosive train derailment that recently led to the evacuation of an Ohio town was among more than a dozen reported rail wrecks in the U.S. since the year began. But for context, guys, the Bureau of Transportation Statistics found that 54,539 trail derailments occurred in the U.S. from 1990 to 2021. That's an average of 1,700 per year. Now, most of them don't lead to massive chemical disasters, but the idea that suddenly trains are derailing all the time is not actually the case. It turns out that's a pretty normal development. I I don't know enough about all this to know why, Uh, and I certainly would be a little nervous if I was a a train operator (laughs) uh, at those stats, but I just thought that's some context people should know. So one thing I will call out here that I've seen a lot in right-wing media, I think is really weird, is people blaming Mayor Pete for all this, who is the Secretary of Transportation. And maybe you could blame our infrastructure and, and problems with that if there are a lot of train derailments. But I think that's kind of a weird urge to blame him here. I'm not really sure how that's related. And I bet you have thoughts on that. 
Yeah, people, um, they do this where they just blame the person who's in charge or whatever, but the Secretary of Transportation doesn't have a whole lot to do with some random derailment in Ohio. Now, you can criticize him for the response. Uh, for example, I just saw last night Pete Buttigieg's official account put out a tweet thread on this. But remember, guys, this happened on uh, February 3rd. So I, you can certainly say that, that waiting to respond over 10 days publicly uh, on your official channels is a mishap he could criticize, be criticized for as the Secretary of Transportation. However, I mean, it's not like this is really his fault, I guess. Yeah. There's, a very, there's a very particular focus on him that I have to say, I mean, I think there's lots that goes into it. He ran for president. He's, you know, pretty, very political, very partisan. He's not some neutral Secretary of Transportation, but also like there is a special emphasis on him, on right-wing media that I can't f help feel is somewhat related to him being gay. I just, I, I just think that if he was a generic, straight, white, normal guy like uh, the labor secretary, right, for the, the, the former Boston mayor who was labor secretary, I just don't think he'd get the same attention, really, than, that he does. And that doesn't mean he can't be criticized. He's done lots wrong, lots I don't agree with, but it just does feel a little sus the overemphasis on him and the rush to constantly blame him for everything. I mean, Secretary of Transportation isn't actually that important a role. I mean, it's important, but it's like in, in terms of the federal government, there's much bigger fish to fry. I tend to agree with you, too, because I think Mayor Pete is pretty milk toast. Like, he's not that controversial. He's not like a lightning rod. I don't really know why conservatives hate him so much. I mean, not that I, like, agree with him a ton, but, I mean, compared to many others in the Biden administration, he's certainly more likable in my book. But I've seen a lot of people blaming the administration as a whole here. I do think they could have done more to call attention to the situation, raise awareness. They were pretty silent on it for a few days. I also think that, you know, there is an urge to avoid the criticism of failures of groups like the EPA that are obviously not capable of really keeping people safe like they claim that I think you would think you would see more people on the right sort of jumping to publicize that, too. And as a whole, this case has kind of just been in print. We haven't seen a lot of coverage on TV and the mainstream media. It's been pretty silent. And part of that probably is because the Biden administration really has not weighed in that heavily here. Yeah, but I also think there's just this tendency to blame everyone, uh, uh, like blame whatever happens in the country while a person is president on that administration, right? That's like people blame Trump for like the Puerto Rico hurricane that really devastated the island and 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 everything. And his response maybe wasn't amazing, uh, but same with like Biden and these kinds of things. I just tend to think the president isn't actually all powerful and and that really a lot of times blame or criticism should be, should belong much closer to home uh right like what were the local regulators doing here is the state government being transparent why are they arresting reporters what about this company too like like they're going to be sued and investigated over this and i don't know but maybe there was some negligence involved. But I just don't think that Joe Biden or Mayor Pete somewhere in D.C. really have that much culpability here on the merits. Um, doesn't mean they've covered themselves in glory in the response, but I do wish we wouldn't try to immediately pin everything on our partisan enemies all the time right away. Fair point. Well, speaking of negligence and partisanship, there is yet another sexual harassment claim coming out of conservative media. It's being brought by former host on The Blaze, Sydney Watson, and she's suing the media company over the behavior of her former co-host, Elijah Schaefer, and problematic behavior that she says she complained about for months and that went unaddressed as she suffered his abuse on their show. And there is a deep expose on this at The Daily Beast. Um, where they detail some of the problems she had. They say Watson thought Schaefer was setting her up to fail, insisting on grossly misogynistic guests and even joking on Twitter about how he wanted her to sleep with talk radio host Sebastian Gorka. According to Watson, Schaefer was often drunk on set, slugging shots of liquor around recording time. He was obsessed with talking about sex, often specifically gay sex, and would talk about it frequently around her and their guests. Schaefer was ultimately fired from the Blaze in September after allegedly drunkenly assaulting another Blaze media host by groping her breast. At that time, The Blaze tweeted he had been fired for violating company policies and standards. But Watson's claims in her lawsuit say that executives at The Blaze knew that Schaefer's problems with female employees went back far earlier. 
Uh, she said that once she received her co-hosting spot, The Blaze, uh, he insisted on inviting guests like white nationalist leader Nick Fuentes. And in her account, Watson found herself set up as Schaefer's foil on the show, frequently embarrassed by her co-hosts and tricked into reading anti-Semitic messages from Schaefer's far-right fans aloud on the show. It became a running gag for Mr. Schaefer and his audience that some of Mr. Schaefer's fans would leave super chat comments with coded dog whistles that referenced grossly misogynistic and or anti-Semitic comments from Ms. Watson to read with her not knowing what they meant. The complaint reads, I'll, I have I'll to hop in there. there because I'll pause there. There's more, but let's pause there. Yeah. I, I watched their show they did together. It was called You Are Here. It was interesting, but kind of wild. And that part is 100% true. They would comment things and then Elijah would have her read them and she wouldn't know what she was saying because it's like weird alt-right internet edgelord code language. That is 100% true. All of this is, all this reporting is coming from Sydney's complaint, which is the lawsuit, the legal document. So it is only one side of the story, to be fair. But that part I can personally say is true because I watched the show and I saw it happen. It's also worth noting that Sydney, who I like, I'm friendly with, she is, you know, kind of an anti-feminist in some ways. You know, she's a conservative woman, a kind of strong, powerful woman, but she's not like a woke feminist, right? For her to be saying that this was a uh, an environment with sexual harassment and, and sexism rife throughout it, it, it has to be bad, right? It's not like woke, frivolous complaints about they, how they set the thermostat, right? And how that's sexist. Um, but... It's also her lawyer, Kurt Schlichter, is a very Republican, MAGA, super conservative guy. I mean, this is not like, uh, clearly this has more going on here than just some sort of ideological bias or dispute. And I have to say, I, I, I find her very credible. I, I think, I don't know what happened. Obviously, we have a statement here from The Blaze uh, that said that the claims alleged in this complaint are false. We look forward to prevailing in this matter where the plaintiff's statements, emails, and text messages will show in her own words why this case might generate publicity but will fail on the merits. So we have to kind of include the caveat that this is only one side of the story and the blaze says this isn't true. But I have to say I believe her. I, I find her very credible. She's a serious person. She wouldn't do something like this unless there was a real meaning to it, I believe. Um and it tracks. I've been inside conservative media companies and they have a consistent problem. We've seen this at all the big conservative media companies. We hear whispers about it all the time of not living out their values of, you know, chivalry and traditional values and traditional men and respecting women and pro family and all these things. But then you hear about a lot of these conservative companies and on the insides, they operate more like frat houses, degenerate frat houses, uh, than they actually do, you know, respectable institutions with family values. So it tracks with a much broader trend. Well, I have to push back on you. And, and one thing that you said, which is that thermostats are sexist and I won't hear otherwise, because there is good data showing companies would save thousands of dollars per year if they would simply make it a little bit warmer in the offices where women would be comfortable. And yet they continue to blast everybody with freezing cold air to keep the hot bodied men in their suits comfortable. Meanwhile, every woman I know who works in office has a heater under their desk on round the clock. It is sexist and it needs to change. Aside from that, everything you said was spot on. For context, guys, Sydney Watson is actually one of the people who appeared on the Vice Feminism panel that Brad and I reacted to on the show, and she was one of the anti-feminists on the show. She's so, the Australian, people will yeah, remember. The, one, the she, only one who we agreed with at all. <laughs> right, the only one who had any good points throughout the entire segment. But she she certainly is not some sort of woke activist here. And these seem to be um, things that were going down on air that people could observe. So I think it's fair to you know wait and see what happens in lawsuits. But I'm also inclined to believe her. Uh, the Blaze suspended their show in May, according to her lawsuit. The company fired Watson in July after a lawyer working for her complained to the company about Schaefer's actions. Uh, they say the Blaze instead opted to cater to the demands, tantrums, and misbehavior of another young rising star, a male one who, long after Ms. Watson had been terminated for complaining and demanding justice, was finally fired based on allegations that he physically assaulted and manhandled at least one other female, the Bla um, Blaze employee, the complaint reads. Watson had signed a multi-year deal with Blaze Media that she claims was worth nearly $1.3 
million. So I thought this was um, really infuriating to read. And you were absolutely correct in saying this is something you and I have observed across. Well, many- just, just sorry, before you go on, it sounds like she was also fired in retaliation for complaining, allegedly, yeah. according right. to her complaint, which that in and of itself is not allowed. And yet true. we and yet we see it all the time. I and I. You know, this sub, the subject makes me a little mad because I am a very upfront person and I'm inclined to like name names right now. But I have to be honest, I'm even a little bit fearful to do that because there is so much retaliation in our industry. Even if you don't work in house somewhere, just saying some of the practices that go on in these companies, naming some of the bad men who continue to be at the top of their craft, who continue to be protected by these organizations, knowing some of the things they do behind the scenes. It is infuriating to me. And it was one thing that deterred me as I was moving into media from wanting to go and house at any of these places. I've often had people ask, when are you going to go in house here? When are you going to go in house there? And I'm like, I don't, I started my own company for a reason. And that is that there are very few good institutions to go work for as a woman, but it really is anybody who is a principled person of character when you get into the realm of entertainment and media. And that has just been my experience across music, across movies, and now in politics. And it's very disappointing because these groups, many of them proclaim family values, claim to care about individual liberty, claim to to not um, have these issues, and yet they're rampant with them. And they do tend to go in one direction where they protect the men who are typically the bad actors in these situations, and they treat the women as if they are disposable. And I find this really disheartening. It's one thing you and I talked a lot about when we were starting Base Politics was creating an environment where we can have jobs, good jobs for content creators who are principled, who won't sell out, and also good jobs in the sense that when they're here, we treat them well, we treat them with dignity, we treat them, we give them autonomy, we live out our values, and we make sure that it is a safe environment especially for women to work in. That's one thing you and I have been really passionate about behind the scenes is trying to amplify the voices of women. That's one thing I've always loved about you, Brad, is like you're very passionate about that. And and I think that that's so rare in our industry. And I hate to see this. I don't personally know Sydney or have a relationship with her, but I know many other women who have been in almost identical situations to this one. And it's really infuriating. It keeps happening. And people will say, oh, well, she's suing. She just wants money or publicity, like they said in the statement. That's not really fair for a few reasons, but one of which is that change never happens until people go public. So, for example, I have firsthand experience in one conservative media system where there was um, widespread kind of inappropriate behavior towards towards women in the office, and it was complained about, it was known, it was discussed, yet nothing happened until somebody it went public and it was reported on and it was like a scandal. Then there was an investigation, people were let go, action happened. So I don't think it's fair to throw shade at people for going public or going legal on stuff like this. Um, oh, couldn't you just work inside the house? Couldn't you try to fix it? Couldn't We're all on a team, aren't we? Blah, blah, blah. No, that's not really how it works. It'd be nice if it worked that way. That's not really how it works most of the time in practice. Secondarily, a lot of these women get blacklisted. That's the other hard truth right here is that when you do complain inside the system, you often are fired. And when you are fired, you often are then blacklisted and other companies won't hire you. Suing is no small decision from any woman I've spoken to who's gone through this process. They usually go into it knowing they're never going to work in TV again. And they won't, (laughs) especially if they win. If you become a woman who brought a lawsuit like this against a media company, the other media companies simply won't hire you because they'll see see you as too big of a risk or a liability. And so it is, you really are in a rock and a hard place as a woman when you're in these situations of, do you complain? Do you come forward in the first place? Because the opportunity costs are significant. And that's honestly why a lot of women put up and shut up and deal with it because they want to keep their careers that they've worked so hard for. And so it's a very sad reality behind the scenes. And I just want listeners to know, like, this is prevalent and it is a really big problem in our movement. Okay, let's move into our quick hit segment. We've got a nice little roundup for you today, starting with this clip from Arizona Governor Katie Hobbs getting owned over her private school hypocrisy in an interview with Shannon Breams. A reference there to the private Catholic Mm -hmm. high school that you went to. So why shouldn't all students have a chance at what you said was so important in your own life? Look, I grew up in a working class family. This was well before any of this um, of public assistance for private school existed. And my parents made that choice. 
I begged them to send me to public school. Um, and we sacrificed a lot. There were times in my family that we were on food stamps. Um, and so it wasn't, it was a choice that they made. Um, and they struggled to, to make that choice. Um, what I want is for every public, every student in the state of Arizona, no matter where they live, to have access to high quality public education. And with this uh, universal voucher system, um, that's not happening. But if their system is failing, if their public school is failing, no to giving them a chance to go somewhere else like you did? The, the schools are failing because we are failing to invest in them. Um, they're being starved of resources. I have questions, Hannah. First of all, the story about how she begged her parents to go to public school. Ma'am, what? <laughs> that is not something your average 10-year-old would ever actually do. That sounds like yeah. you just made that up. I, I mean, I just... I, I can't prove that she's lying, but that sounds incredibly fake to me. I also think it's hilarious how she's saying, is she saying that her parents were so poor, they sent her to private school, but they were also on food stamps? Because I have Listen, questions about that. Uh, first there is of all. a lot. There is a lot to unpack in this interview. And then, when I said that she got owned, she owned herself. Really? Shannon Bream, who's a, a good <laughs> journalist, a Fox News host, just literally just asked her, like, you benefited from private school, but you oppose school choice for everyone else. Why? And she just blabbered and started saying all this nonsense. And it's hilarious to me at the end where she's like, well, the reason the schools are failing is we're not properly investing in them. Ma'am, no, we spend so much on education. And when in the some public schools are great, but some many are failing students. And, it, and it's usually not for lack of money. It's often for lack of competition, for bureaucracy and inefficiency and stagnation. And the idea that you're going to have benefited personally from private education, but not support other people having access to choice, you're just going to trap them in government schools uh, based on their zip code. I don't know. It's really maddening. And I can see why people are getting fired up over this issue and, and really mad at people like Katie Hobbs, who are hypocrites on this. Well, I think Corey DeAngelis, who's our friend and a brilliant school choice ac activist, has just totally stumbled on the right talking point on this subject, which is that virtually every person out here simping so hard for public schools in the Democratic Party has gone to private school or is currently sending their kids to private school. They are complete hypocrites. And it really does come down to the fact that they don't think every kid deserves an equal education. They don't. They care more about the special interests that are lining their pockets, the teachers unions, the people who are working in the administration of public schools, then they actually do the quality education of every child. And you can tell that even in, when she answers that question Shannon poses, she doesn't deny that kids are trapped in failing indoctrination camps in this country. She tries to blame a lack of resources and claim that public school or private schools and charter schools are somehow siphoning off those resources, which is fundamentally untrue. That's not even how all these policies actually work. They ultimately end up leaving more money per pupil in the public education system because when states pass school choice bills, they can't touch the federal dollars or those allocations. And so basically the ES programs are a mixture of state and local funding that the family gets that leaves. But if the kid was in a public school beforehand, that federal funding stays in the school. So you end up having more per kid. So she's fundamentally wrong. We spend $15,000 per year per average per kid in the public education system, which is double the cost of most private school tuitions. Um, so all of that is just flatly on his face wrong. These people are not very good at even arguing their side of the debate. But when she is caught up being a hypocrite, her word salad is hysterical. She really does just span the gap from saying her parents were poor and worked really hard to send her to private school. She's still one of the people. She was on food stamps, but also she begged to go to public school. I laughed out loud when she said that. Nobody begs to go to public school when you're 10 years old. Like, Mom, send me to be with my comrades so I can be equal. Don't, don't be so aristocratic. You didn't say that as a 10-year-old. Like, that sounds like one of those parents who go on Twitter and they're like, today my son asked me why we keep having gun violence today. He's three years old. Like, no, he didn't. He did not ask you that. Fake. Yeah. You always ask, see those tweets where it's like, Today, I was driving down the street and my five-year-old turned to me and said, why don't people respect trans lives as much as everyone else's <laughs> lives? And it's like, you totally just invented that anecdote out of your butt that did not occur. Uh, and that was my that. reaction. My other reaction was like, this is why Democrats don't usually sit for interviews with Fox News. Because Shannon Bream did not do anything unfair, untoward, no gotcha. She just like put mild scrutiny, just like asked her a somewhat tough question and she imploded like a house of cards and they're used to not having anything like that they're really used to being treated with absolute kid gloves by the media 
And that's why they don't do these kind of interviews very often. But when they do, it ends up being delicious entertainment and content for us. So for that, well, Katie Hobbs, thank you. I do want to add one more thing here, and this irks me. And this is something she said where she kept emphasizing my parents sacrificed to do this. My parents struggled to do this. And there is this mentality that I see in it. On the right, I see it applied more to like immigration issues. On the left, I see it applied to school choice where it's like, well, I had to work hard. I had to suffer. So other people should too. Why? Why do you want people to have to suffer? If you're admitting your parents struggled to do that and that you allegedly were on food stamps, which I don't believe you were, but whatever, that they had to go on food stamps just to try to get you an education. That is true for some families where they literally scrimp and save and do anything they can to get their kids out of these failing schools, particularly in the black community in places like Memphis, where I've worked on school choice issues. And these families are desperate. These parents, these single moms, they're working two, three jobs, desperately trying to get their kids out of these schools, not only so they can get a better education, but so they aren't killed by gang, so they don't get sucked into gang violence. So they don't get sucked into these absolute cycles of violence and poverty that are surrounding them. And yet you think that that is acceptable and you are fine with other people having to struggle like that. I would think if anything, if you'd witness people struggle like that in your own life, you would want to ensure others didn't have to. And I think that is such a disappointing statement from her. Yeah. All right. Well, up next in our quick hits, we've got a Shark Tank billionaire who got roasted for a very bizarre take he decided to post on the internet. So I'm a fan of Shark Tank, uh, I, and if you've watched it before, you will know Kevin O'Leary, who's also known as Mr. Wonderful. Not quite sure why, but he's one of the Shark Tank hosts, the bald guy, uh, and he is a very successful businessman, obviously. But he tweeted the following, uh, and you and I are both pretty hardcore capitalists, but even I was like, what WTF, dude? He said, you may lose your wife, you may lose your dog, your mother may hate you. None of those things matter. What matters is that you achieve success and become free. Then you can do whatever you like. Excuse me, sir? Huh? What? <laughs> uh, that was my reaction too. I, I look. I love to work hard, and I, and I do. I work around the clock. I'm a pretty uptight type A person, and. Yet I still have my family intact. I still have my dog. I still have a relationship. I don't understand why these things need to be sacrificed or or how if you achieve success, you're free. You're free to what? Sit there by yourself because you've driven everybody else away. Like, I don't understand what his point is here. I'm really confused. No, me either, because I'm all about financial success and working hard and capitalism. And I think greed or self-interest can be harnessed for good in free markets. There's nothing wrong with wanting money, wanting to be rich. But it's not the only thing that matters. Like if you're rich, but your family doesn't talk to you and your dog, your, your dog is dead or <laughs> ran away what or whatever. What happened to memes. the dog? What, no, happened, what happened to the dog? To the dog, Kevin? <laughs> you were so busy hustling. You didn't have time to feed your dog his kibble. Like I, what happened I to want the answers. dog? <laughs> we want we answers. Demand, we demand answers, Kevin. What happened to your dog? But the comments roasted this man. So uh, one guy said, DM me, can refer you to a good therapist. <laughs> Someone else said, I read this in a dictionary under sociopath one time. Yeah. And then uh, some some other person said, some people are so poor, all they have is money. And I actually thought that was kind of profound. I don't know. I, I really, like, yeah. I do think people can be poor in their souls, even if they're incredibly rich. Like, that's not all that matters in life. There's actually this philosophy under Stoicism that it's fine to be materially wealthy. It's fine to have success and money, but you are poor if you are not satisfied exactly where you are at all times. Because um, somebody who's always ambitious, always seeking, never can never have enough, will never be happy or content in life because you are always going to be chasing the next thing. And this has actually been a really hard lesson I've learned in recent years of my life. I was a very ambitious person. Not to say I like, just didn't care about anything else, but I, I was very, you know, targeted in, in what I wanted to do with my life and where I wanted to be. And I, I did realize after a time period that I kept getting what I would say I wanted. I kept achieving what my next goal was, and then it would never be enough. There was always something else I wanted, some new goal, some new level. And I had to really have a reckoning around that and recognize that if I didn't sort of um, get a grip on it, that it would always just be chasing a white whale, right? And that's yeah, a I, I have the thing. same thing. I'm, I'll, I've always been super ambitious, and I always compare myself to the best. So I'll literally like, I don't know. I constantly, people will tell me how successful they think I am. And I'm like, really? Cause I, I, you know, this or that. And I compare myself to people who are the absolute like 
top of our field. I compare okay. myself to the Ben Shapiro's of the world, to the Tucker Carlson's of the world, not in ideology, but in their impact they have. And I'm constantly like, well, I'm not doing anything compared to them. But then people point out, they're like, all right, but you are 25, right? You, <laughs> you did just start a few years ago and they've been doing it for 30 years or 20 years. or, And I do kind of have to remind myself that and try to be content with where I'm at because it is advanced for my stage of my career, even if it's not like, I don't know, I do kind of hold myself to these ridiculously high standards. And it is it is important to to not do that. It's it's natural for high perf- yeah. for performers for type A's, um, but I think it's a toxic mindset that we have to keep ourselves out of. But also, I just got to say, the the comment section here was really funny. I love I've I've started reading the comments more on viral posts because they they really are funny. And this guy named Jay replied to Kevin and said, "At least you'll be crying in a Bugatti." <laughs> Still, though, I, w- I would like more explanation from Kevin on just exactly. Yeah, and I also want people like capitalism's peace, uh, defenders need to like stop giving it such a bad rap sometimes. Like, like yeah. I love I love me some good old they're like dirty greed based capitalism as much as the next guy, but try not to make it sound so freaking soulless. Like, right, and I don't think it is to me. It's not, that's yeah. never been why I've been attracted to capitalism. I'm attracted to capitalism because I think it does the most good in the world. I think it enables you to actually have the best relationships and to sort of carve out your path, right? When I was working all the time and not really making time for a relationship or even a dog, like there was a time in my life I wouldn't get a dog because I was like, I'm busy. I've tra- I travel too much for work. I can't have a dog. And once I realized that, I was like, this is a choice I'm making, right? I can still be successful. And I'm like you, I compare myself constantly. and I And I think that's good. You can learn in that way from the best and and hopefully keep improving in your craft. That's a good skill set. That's a good way of looking at the world. But again, if you're constantly in this mentality of just having to get to the next level, you won't ever be satisfied. You will sacrifice things that are really important. And you can choose under capitalism to have a healthy work-life balance. And that is something that you don't necessarily get to choose under other systems. I wish that people like this would not write this kind of thing because I think you're right. It plays right into the hands of like this greedy, like miserable, really cold, stripped down lifestyle where all you do is work and there is no enjoyment. And that's that's not an easy sell to anybody. And I actually just don't think it's accurate. Yeah. And it, you're giving socialists a layup, right, to, to dunk on this and say, look at how bad capitalism is. But like, that's not actually a required belief to, to yeah. love capitalism. Uh, all right. On to our mailbag. We've got some new reviews. Yeah, we love to see it, guys. I actually had forgot to check the podcast yeah, reviews for a little bit. So sorry. Some of you left these like a month or two ago. But um, somebody left a five-star review that says, quality podcast for moderates. It's from a handle that has a bunch of letters. So I can't pronounce it, unfortunately. Um, but they say, I'm a moderate and dislike political extremism on the left and right. Hannah and Brad are two smart political moderates who have great chemistry with each other, which also makes the show entertaining to listen to. 1010 would recommend. So thank you for that. I love that. Um, I will say... I. I don't think we are moderates, at least, I, well, how does it, how to describe? We're not I, ideological moderates. I think we're temperate moderates in our, in our temperate, in that we're not like bomb throwers or just super partisan or toxic or extremely hyperbolic, but I don't think we're, ideologically, we're not very well, moderate. We're, we do have a sound ideology that's based in like libertarianism, but I would say if you're just looking at the two parties, we would seem moderate because we're over here on some issues over here on some issues and like i think to most observers they would say like that's in the middle but our positions are a mix of like far right and far left really like we don't have a lot of middle of the road positions i don't know if i'd say far right positions on capitalism uh, if if the scale far right isn't capitalist they're nationalist well i guess that depends whether we're talking ideological or partisan yeah i get what you're saying but like, I just want to be careful. Don't give me that label. Like, absolutely uh, not hate them. <laughs> on the scale of like, if zero is social, full socialism, and ten is a hundred percent unadulterated free market capitalism, I'm like a ninety-five, and you're like a ninety-nine, right? Like, yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And when it comes to like, I think that's. I guess you know what this is fair to say because when you would talk about like the old school Democrats, I'd be a lot more aligned with them on things like civil liberties and being anti-war whereas now like the modern democrats like when you say far left like i don't know that they are, always are that as much anymore so it's it's difficult to talk about politics because the terms are always changing and the parties are always moving but yeah brad and i are really more to a school of thought that's really grounded in pure free market capitalism true limited government really strong individual liberty values and that's 
That's the best description. Allison says, five stars, great show, great liberty-minded podcast. Brad and Hannah have great real discussions about current events. Thank you so much. That is exactly what we're going for. All right. And Joshua C. says, five stars, entertaining. I come in and out of listening to the show, but I am always glad when I do. Brad and Hannah give a solid liberty-minded perspective to current events while being entertaining the entire time. Thanks, Joshua. Yeah, thanks. I I will say we have... um, I. (laughs) I grew. I, I thought I wanted to be like a a journalist, journalist, and I've come to realize that that's not the way of the future. The way of the future is infotainment, right? Kind of <laughs> information entertainment uh, is what the people want. And while I maybe don't love that, I wish people were interested in dry policy analysis all the time. We just have to live in that world. And so my vision is to do it in as principled and as kind of responsible a way as possible. Uh, and I think that's what we strive for, even if we don't always live it up. I am glad that you find it entertaining. So five star uh, from Mainly Right is, uh, is I have been listening to your podcast every week for almost a year now. I find the sensible manner in which you describe current events very refreshing. In the most recent episode, someone asked about Brad's books. And as soon as the question was asked, I was hoping at least one of them was a Thomas Sowell book. I was very happy to hear Brad name off Basic Economics as the first title. I'm a huge Sowell fan, and I have been wondering if you two had read any of his books for some time now. Anyway, I love your content. Keep it up. And Hannah, your dog, is so cute. Aww. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, Phoenix is a terrorist during this podcast, and you have no idea what we go through trying to film with him. He's finally calmed down this episode and is asleep at you my feet. tell me he's a well-behaved dog, and I, I sort of believe you, but then every time we're on the podcast, he's not well-behaved. It is. I, I feel like it's one of those things where people are like, your kids just try to embarrass you in public. He is a really good dog 99% of the time, but if there are guests, if there is anytime I get on record or if I have a phone call, he's like, let me show my ass. Like I cannot <laughs> understand it. And it's not even that he acts out. It's that like he wears a training collar at all times right now. So usually if I, you know, jerk it, that's his reprimand and he'll he'll cut it. When these incidents happen, he doesn't care. He's like president of the bad boys club. He's like, try and stop me. I don't care. Like I mean, really, it it's wild. But he is cute and that does mostly make up for these stints of bad behavior. All right, let's go on to hot takes. You have to go first because mine got taken in the early part of the show and I have to think of something else real fast. Okay, so mine is, um, I've been watching The Last of Us, which folks that don't know, it's a new HBO series based on actually a video game originally. But episode three has proven very controversial uh, in some quarters of the internet because is, is The Last of Us is like a post-apocalyptic zom- zombie-based series. But in episode three, they introduce a gay couple that survives together and I, I will just say, and some people on the right were triggered by it and are like, oh my God, woke, whatever. And it's like, literally, I think they're just offended by any depiction of gay people existing sometimes. Um, but I have to say, my hot take is it's one of the best episodes of television I've seen in a long time. And it absolutely wrecked me. I was bawling. Reggie literally came over and started sticking his nose in my face, trying to figure out what was wrong because he sensed how sad I was, but it was a beautiful, beautiful episode and I loved it. Okay, so I was going to ask you as I saw you comment on it. I watched the first two episodes of the show and was bored out of my mind. <laughs> Did not like really? it, but I love yeah, it. That, I thought it was really slow and like, I don't know, I'm just, that's not my genre, you know. You thought it's the just first not. episode was slow? It was the so first, intense. Like, no, the first like 20 minutes of the first episode I liked and that's why I kept watching. But then I thought it got slow after that. But then I saw all the commentary online about the third episode. It has Ron Swanson in it. Watch Apparently it. He's Watch a the third. At least give the third episode a shot. It's yeah, it's pretty. Okay. It's pretty. I think I'll it's pretty back. amazing. So my hot take, I'm going to keep with the Valentine's Day tradition and take this a step further. And this this is a sexist take. I'm not going to, you know, sugarcoat this at all. But I think Valentine's Day is mostly about women. Like, I think it's fine if you have a boyfriend, you should get him a card, maybe get him a little something. But like, I think women should get the bigger gifts on Valentine's Day. I just, I don't know. Okay. Like, what do you get a man for Valentine's Day? What do you get them? Like, I, I really can't think of like, and I'm, I'm a gift giver. I like to give nice gifts, but I'm like on Valentine's Day, like men don't want diamonds. I think it matters more to most women than it does to most men. Honestly, yeah. like women are like, oh, what are we going to do for Valentine's Day? And the guy's like, oh yeah, that's coming up. <laughs> men don't really care about flowers. I love flowers. I get I don't, I don't care on about average flowers. about three bouquets a year on Valentine's Day because my dad always sends them, another family friend always sends them, and then usually like a romantic partner gives them. So 
I have like a full garden in my kitchen. I love that. Um, I don't know. I just I just think it is more about women than men, though, for sure. That's my hot take. All there right, guys. Happy Valentine's Day. That's a wrap. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Again, be sure to leave us a five-star review. We'll read it on air. Leave us a comment on YouTube. And until next week, stay based. <laughs>